I believe that God is going to speak to our hearts. And as we prepare our hearts to receive the word, I believe the best way to do that is upon our knees. And so if you're able to, please, let's kneel together. And if you can't kneel, bow your heads where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together. And let's let the Lord speak to our hearts. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another holy Sabbath day of rest. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for another opportunity to hear heaven speak and all the earth can remain silent before thee. Lord, we're asking for the forgiveness of our sins. We're asking for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And we're praying that you would please make your words plain to our hearts today. And Lord, I believe that there are some of us in this room that need to make some decisions. And so, Father, I pray, please agitate us. Speak to our hearts. And let us not get peace nor rest until we surrender all to Jesus. This is our prayer that we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. As we prepare to study the Word of God, we have been going through what was called the Unlock Revelation series. And as we were going through the Unlock Revelation series, we were looking at the book of Revelation and we were studying it in many different manners and looking at the various truths. And there's really no way that you can exhaust the book of Revelation when we properly understand it. The book of Revelation references the Old Testament well over a hundred times in and of itself. So in other words, to properly understand the book of Revelation, you really have to understand the Bible. You have to understand the whole book. And so it is that we, are, we would dare not think that because we have arrived at this point in our study where this is the conclusion of our Unlocked Revelation series, please do not deceive your hearts for a moment and think the whole book has been unlocked. There's much, much more that we need to study, much, much more that we need to go over and find out all of the truths that God brings to his people. But I want you to capture a very, very key point when we study the book of Revelation. Let us go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. When you go to Revelation, the first chapter, you will remember that the book of Revelation has a very specific focus. And I want you to see what that focus is looking at the book of Revelation, starting at verse 1. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, and when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible makes it very, very clear. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, it says, verse 1, the revelation of who? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The book of Revelation is a revealing of Jesus Christ. It's designed that it comes from the Father to the hands of the Son, to the angel, to the churches, to the prophet, to the churches. And when God gives his message, he wants to show them things to come things that are going to affect God's people as we go through our journey from the world of Egypt, if you will, all the way to our heavenly Canaan. And that's why the book of Revelation speaks largely of the experiences of God's people. And the reason it does that is because it shows two points. Go to the book of Isaiah 63, and I want you to watch the two points. We, we looked at this before, but we're going to look at it again. In Isaiah 63, when we look at Revelation and we see all of the different symbolism that's used and all the different events, timelines, etc., it's bringing out a very profound point. And I want you to see it in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to what chapter? 63. We're going to Isaiah 63, and I want you to consider verses 8 and 9. In Isaiah, the 63rd chapter, we're looking at verses 8 and 9, and just watch what God is showing us here. The Bible says in Isaiah 63, starting at verse 8, it says, For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie, so he was their Savior. Verse 9, In all their affliction, the there is God's people, in all their affliction, who was afflicted? It says he was afflicted. This is God himself. God himself. When God's people are afflicted, it is as it were God himself is afflicted. When God's people go through pain, it is like God himself goes through pain. God has truly associated himself with his people. 
And therefore, when you study the book of Revelation, we're watching God's people go through a series of times and events all the way down to the very close of Earth's history. And we're watching how the devil is still at war with Michael. Wait a minute. Pop question. According to the Bible, who is Michael? That is Jesus Christ. Amen. So we know that Satan is still on an attack mission against Jesus. But because Satan cannot touch Christ directly, he goes for Christ's people. Because the Bible just said, in all their affliction, who was afflicted? Jesus was afflicted. God, the Savior, was afflicted. So Satan knows every time he hurts us, it is as it were he's hurting God. And so when you study the book of Revelation, we're reading about this incredible, great controversy. It is between Christ and Satan, but it's over God's people. And so when you study the Bible, you'll find that, yes, it is a revelation of the character of Christ, giving victory and striving with his people literally throughout the ages all the way to the close of time. But everything gets summed up with these two women. These two women of revelation is what everything kind of sums up in, because Babylon deals with those who have decided to fall under the power and leadership of Satan and to do his bidding. But then you have the remnant, which are those who choose to follow God and to honor him, come what may. And as a result of that, when you look at the Bible, Babylon the Great and the remnant, it's like that's a major, major issue all throughout the book of Revelation when you carefully study it. Satan trying to attack God through the people. Satan uses his people to attack God. God obviously has his saints that stand for his truth and represent him. You follow that? Well, when you get towards close to the end of the battle, when you get to the book of Revelation, but this time when we study Revelation, we're we're thinking about chapter 17. In Revelation 17, we learn about something. Go to the book of Revelation 17 and watch what the Bible says. Because we're getting towards the end or the closing of the battles between Christ and Satan and the people. And when you look at Revelation 17, notice what the Bible says. And when you get there, just let me know by saying amen. Amen. All right. Well, the Bible says in Revelation 17, key character, it says in Revelation 17, starting at verse 1, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery what? Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon is a very, very key culprit in the Bible that is a consistent kind of instrument, if you will, that Satan uses to attack God's people, which is in essence to attack who? Christ himself. Very good. Now, Later on in this chapter, the Bible tells us this, specifically in verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb. They're going to still try to fight against the Lamb, but in trying to fight against the Lamb, they're really still fighting against God's people. But notice, it says, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Let the church say amen. Amen. The Lamb shall overcome them. Jesus said in John 16 and verse 33, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He says, put a stamp on it, it's done. So if we are in Christ, then we have the right to say by faith, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so it is that the Bible says that the Lamb shall overcome them. Why? It says, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him, the saints, it says they are three things. What are they? called. What else? Chosen. Chosen. What else? Faithful. Faithful. This is the testimony you want about your life. This is the testimony that I pray. And you know, I can say it all I want. It doesn't matter what I say, and I'm sorry to say it. It doesn't matter what you say. What's important is that God can say it. The Bible makes it clear that a day is going to come where Jesus is going to come back for a people, and he's going to look at them and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
Well, the reason they were faithful is because they were chosen. The reason they were chosen is because they responded to the call. So as a result of that, there's going to be a group of people whom God has called. They listened. They were chosen. Then they were empowered, and they were faithful unto death. And they earn that crown of life. They are ones who have received the merits of their Savior, allowed him to have his own way in their hearts. And as a result of that, God sees the reflection of his son in his people, and he has no problem giving them every reward of heaven. Amen. My brothers and sisters, this is what's available for you and I. God makes it very clear. We are all called. We can be the chosen and we can be the faithful. Now, the reason why this is important is because, yes, we're in the midst of the war. It's about to get worse before it gets better. But God has already made it clear that if we are faithful unto the end, we will be counted amongst those who have victory in Jesus' name. But the key is we must be counted amongst the called, the chosen, and the faithful. We must be counted amongst that if we want heaven and all of its promises to be our own. Now, considering that, my brothers and sisters, that means that we have to understand this verse, because the Bible says, for many are what? Called, called but few are chosen. which means very little will be faithful. God gives a very serious picture. It's a solemn picture. Do you know the picture of the faithful being few, being so small, is actually mentioned by Jesus himself? Go to Luke 18. Watch what the Bible says. In Luke, the 18th chapter, Jesus himself, he asks a question. And I want you to watch how he asks the question. And we're considering now Luke, uh, the 18th chapter. And I want you to see what the Bible says because it's worthy of our notice. The Bible says in Luke 18, and when you get there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Luke, the 18th chapter, we're going to consider verse 6. The Bible says in Luke, in fact, let's start from verse 1. Let's, I like context. Let's start from verse 1. It says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Amen? Amen. Then it says, saying, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, avenge me of mine own adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow does what to me? Troubleth me. I will avenge her, lest by her con con continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust, unjust judge said? Notice what he's saying, because how did the verse start? Men ought always to do what? Pray. Ought always to pray. Now, Jesus is making this point because some people know how to pray last week, but don't know how to pray this week. There's some people who get to a point that they stop praying. They say, what's the point of prayer? It doesn't seem to work. So Jesus is now teaching through this parable the importance of continual prayer before God, the continual pursuing of him. Even when it seems like he's not answering our prayers, keep pressing. So he gives this story of how an unjust judge doesn't want to hear a woman's case, but because she keeps, I guess in this parable you would call it nagging. He's nagging her. She's nagging him. She's constantly coming to him, please, please. And he says, you know what? I'm going to give this woman what she wants, lest she wearies me. She's going to keep coming to me. So now Jesus is, you know, he's kind of unfolding the parable. And he says again in verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry how often? Day and night unto him, though he bears what? Long with him. Brothers and sisters, listen. When you're crying day and night, when you're going through your battles, never, ever give up. Never get to that place that you cease to pray, that you cease trusting God, that you begin to entertain the suggestions of the devil and demons and start saying, maybe God doesn't care about me. Maybe he's not even listening to me. Jesus gave this parable to debunk that idea. He says, no, though the saints may cry night and day, he says, and God bears long with them. He made it clear one day God will avenge you. One day you be patient, saints. God will avenge you. And so he goes on and he says, night unto him, though he be bear long with them. And then he says in verse 8, he says, but I tell you that he will avenge them how? Spirit. Nevertheless. In other words, men should always pray. They should always exercise faith. Look at what the unjust judge did. But God is a faithful judge. Therefore, even though you cry night and day and God bears long with you, keep coming, keep pressing, don't give up. God will avenge you speedily. But then he says, nevertheless, 
Nevertheless, notice what he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he even find faith on the earth? There are going to be a lot of people that's going to give up. It's, it's deep. It's like he gave the parable to try to stress the importance of holding on. If the unjust judge still gives the woman her prayer and answers it, how much more shall your righteous judge do so? Amen. But Jesus says, nevertheless, when I come back, will I even find people who have this kind of faith that they will pray without ceasing? You see, there's going to be very many called, but few will be chosen. And as a result of that, very little will be faithful. And God says, hang in there, saints. God says, don't give up. God says, listen, and listen, as a preacher, you don't think the devil whispers in preacher's ears? You don't think the devil sometimes says, how long are you going to bear with these people? These people don't listen. No matter how much you try to tell them this, that, and the other, it seems as if sometimes you're talking to a, a crowd that does not hear. Sometimes you seem to do work, and it seems like there's no fruit. Sometimes you're putting out your best, and you're burning yourself out. You get into the point you're pouring out your life almost literally to see the saints saved. And sometimes there's a devil that whispers in the preacher's ear that says, you need to give up. You got good business skills. Go back into business. You can get back to that six-figure income. Remember that? We got to understand, brothers and sisters, that's not the time to give up. You got to keep praying. You got to keep pursuing. We've been called, but few are going to be chosen and far less are going to be faithful. And Jesus showed that. And my brothers and sisters, I want you to understand when the Bible says many are called, I can guarantee you he's called each and every one of you. Amen. But the question is, did he choose you? And the question is, will you be faithful? And so it is that when I look at Revelation's picture, there's going to be a victorious people. Praise the Lord for that. But the, tr the question is, will I be counted amongst the call, the chosen, and the faithful? And if you say, Lord, by your grace, I will be counted amongst the called, chosen, and faithful, could you please so signify by the slipping up of your hand? How many of you say, by God's grace, I want to be counted amongst the called, the chosen, the faithful. Now watch this. Because of our desire and our commitment to God to say, Lord, I want to be amongst those that will respond to the call. Jesus is calling, but you got to respond to the call. Amen. And then he'll choose you, and then he's going to enable you to be faithful. Considering that, I thought about this. Did you know there's a key part in fulfilling the call? God is calling. God is calling. He's calling to each and every one of us. But there's a key part in fulfilling the call. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you and I can want heaven, but that doesn't mean you're going to get it. It's going to take a lot more than wanting. I read a little book called Steps to Christ. And when I was reading that little book, I remember especially reading page 48. And when I read Steps to Christ, page 48, it says many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They did not choose to be Christians. So hope and want is a good start. It's just a bad finish. Are you following? You don't want to ever get to a place where all you do is want and want. Sometimes you got to choose. You get that? Now watch this. So when I think about the fact that Christ makes the call, there's a key part in fulfilling the call. And watch the word of God carefully. The Bible lets us know ye are called in what? one body. You see, when God calls his people, he calls them together. Amen. You understand that? No independent Adams. No, that's not God's way. God says he calls us together. When he calls us, he calls us into what? One body. Now watch that. What is this body? He, Jesus, is the head of the body, the? You see, God is trying to develop a team. God is trying to develop a team in these last days. Because I can guarantee you this, Satan is developing his team. I can guarantee you that. But God, in contrast, is developing his team. And so it is that, yes, we are called. And a key part in fulfilling the call is to understand that when he calls us, he's calling us into one body. That body, the Bible says, is he's calling us to the church. Then when you think about that, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. I want you to watch what God is doing. Christ is making calls. We say, oh, Lord, I want to respond to the call. God says, all right, if you're responding to the call, then a key to the call is that I'm calling you into one body. You see, God called people out 
of a body. The Bi that Bible tells us in Revelation 18 that he says, come out of her, my people. That's Babylon. Yes, yes. So when God calls us out of that body, he's calling us into another body. Are you following? Yes. And so it is that when we think about that, you are called in one body. That body is the church. And the way you enter into that body is through baptism. You understand that? This is God's plan. It's his program. It's his modus of operation. And so it is. That's why the Bible says in the book of Acts, notice what it says. Then they gladly received his word and were what? Yeah. Were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000. See, they were baptized and they were added unto them. I was not satisfied with them. What do you mean them? What does that mean to be added unto them? So I go a few verses down, and then it says, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So please understand, in the mind of God, baptism is far more important, deep, and signifies much greater depth than a lot of people think. When an individual gets baptized, they're making a statement that I am responding to the call, and I have been chosen, and now I must be Faithful, Brother Willie. Faithful, Sister Bessie. Faithful, Sister Snow. Faithful, Brother Theodore. It's not enough to just be called. You responded to the call. Bless your heart. You have clearly been chosen because you have walked through the ordinance. But now you have to be faithful. That will be your test. It's all of our tests. And so we must understand that in the eyes of God, baptism has deep, deep, deep significance because it's making a statement before heaven and earth, before men and angels, that I am God and he is mine. I am God's. He belongs to me and I belong to him. And so it is that baptism holds deep significance in the eyes of God, to the point that, watch, what really does it mean in the first place? Let's go to Romans 6. If you go to Romans, the sixth chapter, notice what the Bible says. Because a lot of times we may not or we forget what baptism was supposed to represent. And we begin to treat it like just some emblem, you know, something that people do, like a ceremony that's very empty, meaningless, and very ceremonial. But the Bible makes some deep, deep indication of the meaning of baptism. In Romans, the sixth chapter, notice what the Bible says as we consider verses four to six. It says in Romans six, starting at verse four, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. Resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not what? Did you know that baptism is a symbol that God would use of how he can take a man from his old life, take a woman from his old life, bury that old man or that old woman, and through the power of his spirit, enable them now to live a new life where they no longer serve sin, which means they're victorious over sin. This is literally what baptism was always supposed to signify. You see, watch this. It represents the believer following Christ into his death, burial, and resurrection. The symbolism is perfect and filled with deep meaning. In baptism, the eyes are closed, hands are folded, and breath is suspended as in death. Is that right? All right, then it says, then comes burial in the water, and then resurrection from the watery grave to a new life in Christ. When raised from the water, the eyes open, and the candidate begins breathing again and mingles with friends. It's a complete likeness of the resurrection. This is, this is how deep the symbolism of baptism was, in, or it is, in the eyes of God. It says the great difference between Christianity and every other religion is simply the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now watch, it says, the Lord instituted baptism by immersion as a memorial of this glorious event. This is why no other method is acceptable to God except by immersion. You can't sprinkle people and baptize. You destroy the whole plan. Yeah. You can't pour rose petals over people. You spoil the whole plan. 
It was supposed to be a living testimony of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how God has enabled us to live the new life in Christ, which is a life above sin. This is what God wanted to teach. And so it is that baptism is very significant in the eyes of God. Now, how essential is it? How essential is baptism? And the reason why I'm, I'm going over this is because of two things. There are some of us in this room that have not been baptized. If you have not been baptized, this message speaks most directly to you. But then there are some people in this room that have been baptized, but the truth of the matter is, as we search our heart, when we got baptized, for a lot of us, all we did was get wet. And there was nothing more in the experience except that. And you can go a lot of places to get wet. You can go to beaches, you can go to your bathroom. It's not about getting wet. It's about entering into the experience. It's about understanding the experience. So what's my point? There are some people that got baptized that actually need to be rebaptized because they don't understand what they did when they did it five years old, 10 years old, etc. and some of us even 20 and 30 years old. Now, continuing, how essential is baptism? You tell me. The Bible says, and now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and do what? Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Bible makes it very clear that baptism is signifying a washing away of your sins and entering into a new life. This is what God wants to do with each and every one of us. This is why Jesus would say to uh, Nicodemus, he would say, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God takes this thing very seriously. We should too. Continuing, how serious should the ordinance be taken? Considering that, we saw it's essential, how serious should the ordinance be taken? In other words, we see it's essential. Yes, I need to be baptized. I need to give my heart to the Lord. Or maybe I need to be rebaptized because, quite honestly, I'm still living a double life or whatever it may be. And you get to a place where you ask yourself, well, how serious, is the ord- how should it, how serious should the ordinance be taken? Well, I want you to consider John 8. Go to John 8 for me. We just saw that when someone gets baptized, they get baptized into a body. Baptism always has a direction. It has a focus. You get baptized into a body. You don't just get baptized. You get baptized into a body, and the body is the church. But there is an issue, and I want you to watch this carefully. In John, the eighth chapter, I want you to watch what the Bible says in verse 37. In John 8 and verse 37, watch this, because when you're baptized, you now become part of a family. You're entered into one body now, one family, okay? That's your church family. But now watch this. Here goes a group of people that was part of a family. This family was called the Jews. Now watch it. The Bible says in John 8 and verse 37, Jesus says, I know that ye are Abraham's what? So they were part of Abraham's family, right? He says, I know that you are of Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. In other words, they were in Israel, but they were not thinking nor behaving like Israelites. Are you following that? Because Jesus is saying, I know you're Abraham's seed, but you're planning to kill me. And he's seeing that this is a contradiction. So let's go ahead in verse 38. It says, I speak that which I have seen with my father. And you do that which you have seen with your father. We're going to continue. Verse 39. They answered and said unto him, who's their father? They said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. You understand that? So Jesus is challenging their profession. Then he says, going on now in verse 40, but now you seek to kill me. In other words, Abraham wouldn't have done that. So he's going on. He says, but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. So again, second time now, Jesus says, you got another father. Because they say, Abraham's our father. Jesus says, no, he's not. Now he says, you do the deeds of your father. Now watch this. Then he says, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So now they took it to a higher level. Now they're not just children of Abraham. They're children of God. Now going on, it says, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, 
you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. And Jesus said, parables over. Verse 44, now he tells straight testimony. He says in verse 4, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now, I don't know if you're catching what Jesus is doing. Jesus was trying to help them understand children do what their fathers do. You understand that? That's what he's trying to say. He said, if you were Abraham's children, you would have done what Abraham did. You would have exercised faith. If you were truly the child of God, you would have done what children of God do. You would have accepted me. But because you're trying to do what to me? What were they trying to do to him in verse 37? They're trying to kill him. So now in verse 44, he says, you know who your father is? He says, you are your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you will do. Why? Because he was a murderer. You understand that? Jesus is showing them your behaviors testify who your father is. And so the verse continues. Now, my brothers and sisters, what's my point in giving this verse connected to the question? How serious should the ordinance be taken? A lot more serious than people take it. These people were part of the stock of Israel. They were counted amongst the camp. In other words, today they would be good old Seventh-day Adventist Christians in good and regular standing. They would be good Christians in good and regular standing at whatever church they are part of. But Jesus had to wake them up and say, just because you are the literal physical descendant does not mean that you're a child of God. There are some people that can get baptized and join a church, but still talk, behave, watch, act, dress, eat, sleep, and do lots of things like they used to do before baptism. And they're testifying that you have not ended up and rose up in the new life because the old life was never surrendered. And so when we think about the question, how serious should the ordinance be taken? My brothers and sisters, we should be, as is said in the world, we should be dead serious about it. We should understand and make sure if I'm going to get baptized, how serious should I be about this ordinance? And at this point, it's now okay for me to share with you a little word from what we call the pen of inspiration. Now that we've done our studies on the gift of prophecy, etc., it's time for you to see a statement that comes from the pen of inspiration that magnifies this point. We are told, my friends, and I want you to think about this when you think about baptized, those who have been and those who are preparing to be. It says, the test of discipleship is not brought to bear as closely as it should be upon those who present themselves for baptism. Sometimes people are not understanding what does it really mean to be baptized into the body of Christ. Continuing, it says, It should be understood whether they are simply taking the name of Seventh-day Adventists or whether they are taking their stand on the Lord's side to come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. This is what ought to be done. And so it concludes by saying, before baptism, when? Before Before baptism, there should be a... As to the experience of the candidates... This is why folks don't just say, I want to get baptized. And we say, all right, no problem. And they just rush them into the pool. Because when you get baptized, you get baptized into a body. And you want to make sure that you understand what this body believes. And you want to make sure, is my life okay with this? Is my life in harmony with this? True story. There's a man who got baptized. There was one church, and a man got baptized. And he got baptized into his, you know, Sabbath-keeping church. And uh, when the man got baptized, they, they baptized him very quickly. And then they, they, did not, they did not give him the thorough inquiry. They didn't really go through it. And this thorough inquiry is not to be done in a cold, callous manner. It's not like we're going to turn a light on and put it on their foreheads and say, all right, sit down, and start interrogating. Please don't misunderstand the thorough inquiry. It's done very lovingly, very tenderly. Amen? Amen. Well, here it is that, you know, this man, he got baptized too quick. And uh, they, not only that, the pastor decided to make him a deacon. Real quick, you know, baptize him, and then said, you know what, we're going to make you a deacon. And then immediately made him a deacon. He didn't even understand what it was to be a deacon. Well, one day the man's serving in the church as a deacon. This is in Texas. It's a true story. And he's serving in the church in, in Texas, and he's doing everything. And one day he says, Pastor, you know, I'm just so happy to be a deacon. I'm so happy to be in the church. He says, Pastor, can you just come by my house? I want to serve you dinner. And the pastor said, all right, well, that's very kind. Pastors like it when you invite them to your homes. 
And so it is, amen. <laughs> and so it is that the man invites the pastor to the home. The pastor comes to the house, gives him a little lemonade before it's time to eat the meal. So the pastor's sipping on that lemonade and enjoying it, very tasty. And then the pastor says, so what's for dinner? And then the man says, we are going to have my favorite, pork chops. And when the man said pork chops, the pastor practically choked on his lemonade. Because the pastor was like Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. I mean, he's going through all the Bible passages that makes it clear that the pig is an unclean animal and not fit, according to the Bible, for human consumption. So the pastor is wondering, sir, uh, you know, I don't understand, but uh, in case you did not know, we as the people of God believe in the Bible, and we believe that our bodies are God's temples, and we are not to put anything that God labels unclean in it for consumption. And you know what that deacon said? He said, what? He said, nobody taught me that. Is this what this church believes? He says, I run a hog farm. And we not only eat it regularly, we sell it. Well, that pastor said, well, sir, I'm so sorry, but I can't tell you. And you know what that man did? That man said, that's the last day I'm stepping foot in your church. And he left. We are not doing anyone a favor by hiding where we stand, according to the word. God wants us to make sure that before somebody gets baptized, there is to be a thorough inquiry to help them understand you are joining a body. You are joining a family. Now listen, when somebody comes to your home, is there not a certain way your family functions? And whoever comes in your home, they need to learn how to get acclimated to how the family functions. Is that right? Well, my brothers and sisters, God's church. I didn't say your church, and I certainly didn't say mine. Any true church is God's church, and that's God's family. And God says, amongst my family, there's a way that we do things in my family. And as a result of that, it is imperative that when you teach the Word of God to someone who wants to be baptized, that in love we go to them and say, let me tell you how God's family operates. And we walk them through and help them understand so when they become part of that family, they won't have that what we call Texas deacon experience. And so it is that God says, I want the people to understand. There should be a thorough inquiry. People need to take seriously. Why? Because it's not just taking on a name. But it's a decision on whose side we stand. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead. I got just a couple more slides. This is a pretty short one. How does one therefore prepare or even qualify for baptism? How does somebody do that? Considering that there should be a thorough inquiry, then how does somebody prepare or at the end of the day qualify where the leadership can say, praise the Lord, we are very happy to baptize you? How does that happen? Notice. Number one, you need to learn God's requirements. What does the Bible say? Matthew 28, go ye therefore and do what to all nations? Teach all nations, and then what? Baptizing them, and then do what again? Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So when somebody wants to be baptized, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to be taught. You need to be taught the ways of God, and you need to understand the ways of God. This is how you prepare for baptism. Number two, you must believe the truths of God's word. You must believe it. The Bible says in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth, and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. So you got to believe. You got to believe. So when you're taught the word, the next question is, do you believe the word? Do you accept the word? And then when the individual says, I believe this and I accept this, well, they're almost on the road to going down. But then there's one more. Then they must repent of and turn away from your sins and experience conversion. How do we know this? The Bible says in Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. So notice, before they were baptized, what did they have to do? You had to repent. So there has to be a turning away. You can't live with your girlfriend and be practicing fornication and say, I want to get baptized. You must first repent from living in that sinful fornication lifestyle. You can't say, yes, I'm going to keep smoking and keep poisoning my body, and then at the same time say, well, go ahead and baptize me anyhow. No, my brothers and sisters, you must repent. You got to turn away from those things that are destroying your body. You understand that? So in God's mind, you must repent. Then you get baptized. Now notice what it says. Repent ye therefore and be what? Converted. Well, the next one I'm looking at is right here. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. 
So God expects you to go through a conversion experience. There should be change. Amen? Amen. 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 How long does it take to prepare for baptism? Quite honestly, that depends on you. That depends on you and your walk. Why? We have biblical examples for this. Notice, number one, we have the Ethiopian treasurer. The Ethiopian treasurer in Acts 8, verses 26 to 39, was baptized the same day he heard the truth. Now, why was that? It was because he already had the other truths. He already had the other truths. There was only one essential truth he didn't understand. And once that truth was made plain, there was nothing to hinder him from being baptized. So there are some people that are so advanced in their walk with God that it takes very little time for them. No matter what, you always have to fit those three prequels that we just talked about. You always have to fit that. But some people are pretty much there. Some of them are like one step away. And therefore, they just need the crowning touch of an understanding of certain truths, and they can be baptized. Another example is the Philippian jailer and his family. That was in Acts 16, 23 to 34. That person was baptized the same night they heard the truth. So again, there are cases where individuals, as a result of the thorough inquiry, will so show, I understand, I receive this, I believe this. They might show you some text you never thought about. I've had that happen several times. I'm trying to prepare people for baptism, and they're like, hey, brother, let me, let me show you this. And I'm like, man, I'm going to take that one. That was a good note. <laughs> I'm like, that's a powerful point. So sometimes... People are very advanced in the word. There's just key things they don't understand. I've met many Christians that are a part of many denominations that understand very, very deep Bible truths on many levels, and the only thing they didn't understand was the truth of the seventh-day Sabbath. That's it. They understood. State of the dead, they understood. Sometimes they, they even believed in a remnant. Everything. But for some reason, they just didn't understand the Sabbath and its relevance. And sometimes you go over that with them, and there's nothing hindering them. So it's very possible that it can happen. But then you've got situations like Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9. In Acts 9, 1 to 18, he was baptized three days after Jesus spoke to him on the road to Damascus. So sometimes some people take more time than others. You understand that? So you can't say it takes two weeks, two months, four months, three years. You, you can't do that. It's based on the individual's experience. Our job is to always make sure that we understand God's protocol of how someone is qualified, understanding those three points we talked about. Make sense? Yes. Amen. All right. Is there a such thing then as rebaptism? Is there a place for that? Yes. Let's go to Acts 19. This is our last text. In Acts, the 19th chapter, is there a place for rebaptism? The answer is yes. And I want you to watch this. Because sometimes people say, like I told you, there's some of us that maybe we got baptized, but there probably was not an understanding of vital truths that can affect our salvation. And so I want you to look at Acts 19, and we're going to consider verses 1 to 5. When you get there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in Acts 19, verses 1 to 5, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now notice their answer. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So I want you to watch this. Who is Paul talking to? Are these sinners living in the world? No, because verse 1 said they were what? Disciples. You understand? They were already followers of a believer. So they were disciples. But when the question was asked, have you received the Holy Ghost? They said, we don't even know what a Holy Spirit is. Yes. You understand that? Yes. Now, keep your finger here and go to Romans 7 real quick. Romans 7, just so, just so you can understand the import of that statement. When it says, we don't even know what a Holy Spirit is. We, we don't even know if the Holy Spirit exists or anything. Go to Romans 7, and I, I want you to watch this very carefully now. I'm so sorry, Romans 8. Forgive me, Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. And I want you to watch what the Bible says here. Romans 8. Let's go ahead and look at verse 6. Romans 8 and verse 6. Are we there? Yes. Now watch. We're going to do 6 to 9. It says, for to be carnally minded is what? Yes. Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I encourage you to be spiritually minded always. Then it says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 
Now watch verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God does what? Dwell in you. Now watch this. Dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, how does the verse conclude? He is none of his. And if you are none of Christ, can you go and be with Christ forever? No, you cannot. So would you agree that having the Spirit of God dwelling in you is a salvational issue? So these men are asked, do you have the Spirit of God? The answer is clearly no, because they're saying we don't even know what the Spirit of God is. So this is a salvational subject. This is a subject that can deeply impact their salvation. Are you following? Go back now to Acts 19. So let's continue. In Acts 19, so they didn't even know what a Holy Ghost is. So now verse 3. And he said unto them, verse 3 of Acts 19, and he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto whose baptism? John. So were they baptized? Yes. Yes. The Bible makes it clear. They were baptized. They were baptized unto whose baptism? John. John. So John did baptize them. And when we see John, you remember what John said. John says, I baptize you with water but there's someone coming that's going to baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. Remember that? So John is not involved in spirit baptism. John is involved in water baptism. You understand that? So these brethren, these disciples, were baptized in water. So now, notice what the Apostle Paul does as a result of this. Verse 5, it says, I'm sorry, verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were what? They were baptized in the name of who? In the name of the Lord Jesus. Now verse 5. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And obviously in verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So notice that the Bible makes it clear that They were baptized. They did not understand vital truth that can impact their salvation. In this case, it was the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, Paul begins to teach them. They accept the truth, like the criteria. They believe the word. And then they get re-baptized. And after they are re-baptized, then they get the gift of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. So now we see that in the Bible, there is an example of rebaptism, And rebaptism is applicable in one of two ways that we have looked at thus far. Number one, if an individual is following the Lord, but they come in contact with vital truth that can deeply impact their salvation, and they choose to say, I have never known this before, but now that I know this, my desire is to go all the way with Jesus, and I accept this vital truth as well. It is biblically appropriate for that individual to be rebaptized. My brothers and sisters, we went over some vital truths in the Unlock Revelation series. Amen. We went over things that I heard over and over and over again, the same words, I never knew this. I can, if I could get a penny... For every time I heard people say, I never knew this, boy, we can go ahead and do amazing things at our school right now and support the work at the school. That's how many times I heard, I never knew this. And so when we hear these things, Lord, I never knew this. Lord, I, I've been, I, I didn't understand this. This thing deeply impacts my salvation. I accept this truth. It is biblically appropriate to be baptized. Another way that's obviously biblically appropriate is when we backslide. If you've been baptized when you were 20, and maybe you got baptized, you were on fire for the Lord, but then after that, you went back to the world, started breaking God's commandments, started sinning and doing all sorts of stuff for the devil, and now your heart has been awakened because you heard the voice of Jesus. You heard the voice of Jesus, and you're saying, Lord, I heard your voice. I've been playing games with you. I've been living a double life, but by your grace, now I'm all in and you give a full surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is biblically appropriate to get re-baptized. My brothers and sisters, baptism is a wonderful, wonderful ordinance. It's something that God wants for his people because he's developing his jewels. Some of us have been living double lifestyles. Come to church, 
We go home and we watch cussing and swearing. We watch murder and gunslinging. We go in our cars and we listen to worldly music. We talk amongst our friends and we talk about the things of this world. We cuss and swear. Some of us have committed adultery, lie, cheat, steal. We've done all sorts of things. And yes, there may be some point in time you were baptized in the past or maybe you've never been baptized. Christ is calling you. And if you're responding to the call, then you need to understand you're called into one body that you're now recognized as his chosen. And then after you're recognized as his chosen, he's going to encourage you, be thou faithful, even unto death. For it's then and only then that you receive your crown of life. 24 years ago, in the world, hip-hop culture didn't have any religious profession. All I did was live completely for myself. Whatever I wanted is what Dwayne did. And the gospel kept, as I call it, interrupting my lifestyle. And finally, it got to a point that I heard the voice of Jesus so clear that I said, I can't resist this voice anymore. And when I made a decision, and I went through all these steps and made the decision to surrender my life to Jesus Christ, you know what I did? I called my friends the brothers that I used to party with. <laughs> called all the brothers I used to party with. Called my girlfriend, who I used to fornicate with. Called all of them. Said, listen, come to a funeral. What you calling me to come to a funeral for? And I said, no, this is a different kind of funeral. <laughs> I said, this is, a, this is a whole different kind of funeral. This is the most glorious funeral that you will ever go to. Because you're going to see a man die, but you're going to see a miracle because you're going to see a man live. And I wanted them to come there. And you know why I wanted them to come? Because when they came to that funeral, and when Pastor Stephen Williams lifted up his hand and said, Dwayne Lemon, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he baptized me and came up. My friends were there to see it. Now watch this. This is good. They saw it. I came up, and I was a happy man. You hear me? I mean, happy you don't have to tell me happy Sabbath. It was a happy Sabbath. And so I'm happy hugging everybody and everything else. I'm part of the family of God. I'm part of the family of God. I've been called into one body. I've been chosen. Now, by God's grace, I must be faithful. 24 years ago. And so what happened was my buddy Dino, Dino calls me up. We used to go to this lewd party called Greek Fest. We used to go to Greek Fest every year. And Greek Fest is a place of lust and passion and the most vile sins that you can get yourself in contact with. But me and my friends, we go to Greek Fest every year. That was our ritual. So R Greek Fest came up, and Dino called me. Hey, Dwayne. He was an instrument of temptation. Hey, Dwayne. Greek Fest is coming up, bro. You coming? And I was able to say, Dino, you obviously don't pay attention. He said, what do you mean? I said, that guy that you saw go under the water... He's dead now. And did you know the Bible says the dead can't speak? Did you get that? I said, the Bible says the dead can't talk. The dead have no part of anything else that's done under the sun anymore. Why are you trying to raise up a dead man? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. I said, Dino, the Greek fest is officially a part of my past because old things have passed away. My brothers and sisters, baptism is beautiful. It's a public declaration of what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing in the hearts of humanity in such a late hour in earth's history. And today, we saw four. But you know what? God wants more. And so, it's decision time. And my question to you is this, Jarrett. My question to you, he's still calling. He's still making appeals. His heart's desire is he says, I'm not satisfied. Jesus is happy. All heaven rejoices over one sinner. But you don't read anywhere where it says all heaven is satisfied over one sinner. Heaven's not satisfied. God says, I want more. God says, I'm determined to save as many as possible. And if you don't make it into the kingdom, 
It would be, as it were, forever a void in the heart of God because when God made you, there's nobody else on earth like you that can replace you. God does not look at you like a number. God looks at you as one that if you and you alone sin, he says, I would have come on that cross anyhow. That's how special you are. It would be a tragedy that Jesus has given so much. And we don't give him our all. And so God's not satisfied yet. But we can get him closer to satisfaction. And the way we can get him closer is if we recognize, Lord, I have not been baptized. And I give myself to you. And I'm willing to do it. You know, I can go to parties and clubs. Let me tell you something. When I used to go to parties and clubs, when Dwayne entered the club, everybody knew it. That's how, that's how just crazy I was. I'll go in a club and I'd make myself known. I would dance for the devil. I would stand for him and his principles. I was on stage before thousands of people dancing and lifting up principles of hell. And that's why I said, boy, God, you must have a sense of humor. One day I'm standing before thousands of people. And I'm not in my baggy jeans this time. I'm not in my rugged sneakers. I'm not doing all sorts of spins and splits. But now I'm before 1,000 people in a suit. Standing before thousands of people, and I'm there, and I am giving them the word of God and God's end time message to finish his work. And the very city that I was dancing for the devil was the same city that God brought me back before those people. And it was like God was making a statement to the devil to say, you bruised my heel with Dwayne. But God was saying, I'm going to crush your head with Dwayne. And literally God said, I'm going to use this boy. And he's going to mock and show that you are the one that is a deceiver and a liar. My brothers and sisters, God was vindicated. Oh, it was a pleasure to stand in the very place where I used to dance for the devil. And now I'm standing there before the people of God telling them the truth as it is in Jesus. I know what it's like to stand for Satan. But thank God I know what it's like to stand for Jesus. I believe there's some people in this room that you can look back at your life and you know when you stood for the devil. You know when you were bold and you did whatever you did. Jesus is making a call. His call is, you going to take a stand for me? Jesus said, I already stood for you, and I stood quite a few feet higher than I normally stand. Because Jesus said, I didn't just stand up. It was evil men that lifted me even higher, that you might be saved. And Jesus says, and one more time, Daniel tells us that Michael, once again, is going to stand up for his people. But he can only stand up for his people. And to be his, you got to be called got to be chosen and you got to be faithful and so my question is very simple how many of you heard the voice of God and you know I've never been baptized I need to give my heart fully to him and be baptized or I've been baptized but based on God's word I need to be rebaptized because you know your walk with God and perhaps the games you've been playing and the double life we've been living. And if you know that you're in either one of those places, never been baptized, need to get baptized. Was baptized, but you didn't take your walk with God seriously, and now you're ready to do it for real, for real. If you're in either case, I'm going to ask you to do something Jesus did for you a long time ago. I'm going to ask you, take a stand. Who would be one that says, I'm going to take a stand for the Lord? He did it for me. I will do it for him. Bless your heart. Amen. How many says, he did it for me, God bless you. How many else are going to say, he did it for me, I will do it for him. Amen. Praise God, Sister Kim. Praise God, Sister Kim. Who else would say it? Who else would say it, Lord? You did it for me. I will do it for you. God bless you, brother. Amen. Amen. Who else would say it? It's decision time. It's decision time. Who else would dare to say, I will do it? Praise God, brother. God bless you. Amen. I am so thankful, as is mother. So is daughter. God bless you, sister. Amen. Would there be another that says, that's me. That's me. I need it. Amen. God bless you, sister. Amen. It's decision time. These calls are not going to be made too much more frequently. A day is going to come 
where angels are going to say some of the most saddest words that human ears have ever heard. The Bible says the day is going to come where the doors of probation will close, and he who is filthy will be filthy still, and he who is holy will be holy still. And there will be those who will finally realize and see what's going on, and they'll begin to call upon God and say, Lord, save me. All right, I'm ready to do Bible studies. All right, I'm ready to give my heart. I'm ready. And the angels are going to say the saddest words that the human ear can hear. (laughs) Too late. Too late. Too late. It's decision time. Would there be one more? And you know God is talking to you. Your walk with God is your own. Do not worry about who's to your right or to your left. There's nobody in this room that has a heaven or a hell to put you in. Your walk with God is your own. Make up your mind, my brothers and sisters. Is there somebody else in this room that you know? My life is a double life. I'm playing games with God. And I need to recommit my life with him. God bless you, sister. Amen. Amen. I know that there's more people in this room that need to stand. My brothers and sisters, this is it. This is the last message of this series. God bless you. This is the last message of this series. It's decision time. Would there be another who says, it's me. It's me, Lord. God bless you. If you only knew how much I've been praying for you, I see such a soldier in you. God, my brothers and sisters, God can do anything. God can do anything. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask you to please, uh, as you took your stand, let's come forward together. Let's pray together. You're going to need prayer. You're going to need a lot of prayer. You're going to need a lot of prayer. Uh. If you're up top, come on down. It's decision time. You have been written on my heart. (laughs) You've been written on my heart. Forever, you are written on my heart. And you're on God's heart. And he loves you with an everlasting love. We are so grateful for the decisions that have been made today. And you're going to find that trials will come. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, my brother. You're more than conquerors through him that loved you. You can do all things through Christ who is your strength. And you're going to be shining lights for God. Wonderful shining stars for him. To God be the glory. Um, we're going to have a word of prayer, of dedication for these precious souls. And then uh, after that, we'll go ahead with the close of our service and consider ourselves dismissed if we can. Yes, and all of those, just please sit in the front here. You know, when we're done, we just want to go over some things with you in relation to the principles we talked about, okay? Uh, With that being stated, if we can, let's kneel together, please. Let's just kneel together. Father in heaven, it's a beautiful thing when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, 
So many hearts have responded to your voice. We praise you. We love you, Lord. We just want you to teach us how to love you perfectly. These people are up here, Father, not because of persuasion. They're here because they heard your voice. They've been wrestling for weeks, hearing stirring things that for many of them, they never heard it before. We just praise you and thank you for the miracle that you have accomplished today. Truly, you get all the credit. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. I commit these souls into your hands, Father. I know that trials await them, but they're more than conquerors through him that loved them. They can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. They'll be tempted, but we're grateful now unto him that's able to keep them from falling and to present them faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy. We thank you for your precious promises that by these we can become partakers of your divine nature and we will escape the corruptions that are in this world through lust. I pray that you will secure every individual who has taken their stand for you today. Post double portions of angels around them. And Lord, let us as a church family be part of that angelic host that will wrap our arms around them. They're going to need a lot of love, encouragement, study, counsel, instruction, help in practical ways. Please, Lord, help us to be your hands, your feet, your pocket, your heart. And I pray that every single individual whom you have called today, let not one of them be lost. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. Keep us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.